Hey guys, my name is Nick and welcome back to the channel and welcome to January 2019. Uh, a rather exciting time, I'm sure. Hobby refresh, have a little bit of a reset, have a little bit of think about what you want to do uh, and set your goals for 2019 within the world of the hobby. Uh, so I've had a, a long hard think, uh, spent too much money uh, as usual, um, but for me the year of 2019 is going to be about Knights and Titans. Um, so I've got a number of these projects that have started over, well, since they've started coming out really, um, since the Forge, the Forge Bane kit with the armor just came out. Uh, then we had some other sets where you got some bargainous knight prices coming along. Uh, and then, yeah, just in general I've bought some stuff over the years, uh, second hand and new. And it's time to finally put these boys on the tabletop, get some paint done and finish I say finish, there's never, never a project is finished, let's be clear about that. Uh, but get some of these uh, units uh, back out of the boxes and painted and finished. And what we're going to start with in this video is the build of the Forge World Porphyrian Knight. Uh, so this is the big bad boy with big guns. So let's get straight into the video. So here we go then guys, this is the box that the Porphyrian comes in, one of these large new Titanicus boxes that have been coming out since uh, since the Warlord I think was the first one to do these new uh, new, new box kits. Uh, so you get all this, in fact you can see on that uh, imagery there just in the background next to the uh, Titanicus symbol is the Warlord, so it's almost like they've uh, just recycled the box. Um, so just inside then it's, um, it's all sealed up as you can see, I like to do my box unboxings typically from fresh but um, I'm sure that may change throughout the year because uh, I'm not sure how much of a, a viewership that really generates to be honest, let's, uh, uh, let's be honest there. Um, so let's uh, take a look, so we get a nice big layout of bubble wrap and then underneath we get lots of bags, typical of Forge World. Uh, so a number of bags, uh, so we'll just uh, take all of those out and then what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll cut through a little bit of the chaff of taking stuff out of the box and then we'll line it all up and see exactly what we have get. Uh, one of the key, big key things about doing Forge World kits is to double check your component list. There are a number of mistakes that they still do make, um, human error, whatever, even though you get this little certificate inside the box here at the bottom saying quality controlled and checked and etc etc. Parts still do go missing or they could be so badly warped or badly cast that you can easily get a replacement. Forge World customer service is still very very good at replacing bad parts or missing parts pretty quickly. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll skim through and we'll see what components are inside. So there are six bags of components. Now they're all a little bit jumbled up. I was hoping that they might be uh, like Lego do these days where each build section kind of comes in the right bag for the right order. But it doesn't really matter because I tend to build these not as per the instructions, purely because of the painting aspect and leaving armor panels off and so on. Uh, and some things need to dry and you can continue working on other components. So the order of the instructions isn't super important. Uh, but what is important is making sure that everything is there. So what I've done here is almost kind of lay it out in a logical fashion. So on the right there are all the leg components. We've got the leg plates, the leg armor, the thighs and torso, uh, thighs and lower legs, sorry. Uh, and then in the middle is kind of all the parts that make up the, the torso, uh, the main chassis and everything else. Um, there's a couple of little gun options here that I'll look to magnetize as we go through the build. But just sort of, and then on the left, sorry, uh, right on the far left hand side, uh, we have the, the top missile turret. There's a choice of two missile plates. I may look to make those interchangeable as well. But realistically, from a rules perspective, no one's really going to care whether you've got the high dense missiles or the, the, the more sparse looking ones. Um, no one's really going to argue which is which. Uh, but you can have that missile turret open or closed, as you can see there in the quick demo on that upper torso. And then the rest of the left hand side over here is all of the main guns. Now these main guns are twin Magna Last Cannon and it comes with a pair of these. It comes with two twin Magna Last Cannons, which have some rather tasty rolls. They're heavy 2d3 shots each, strength 12, AP minus 3 and do a damage of 6. Uh, but they can't be used to make Overwatch, so uh, they're, they're pretty damn powerful, right? So, uh, And then you've got the Iron Storm Missile Pod or the Helios Defense Missiles, as I mentioned. There's two different types of missile. 
one one shoots flyers and one can fire indirectly at ground targets. Nothing super super duper exciting about those. It's all about these uh, twin Magna last cannons. So all the components look to be there. Um, so the order I'm going to kind of build it in is mainly the torso piece, then each leg section, uh, and then the weapons. So from that calm, uh, calm orderly looking desk with everything laid out, you end up with a forge world mess, which is typical of me building. Everything just explodes all over the place. Um, but this is the main torso kind of put together. It was quite difficult to try and film this, and uh, in actual fact, my camera was playing up, so it didn't actually record. Uh, but you do have a detailed cockpit area um, with a uh, pilot's chair. Um, I'm not going to paint that because once you put the top armour on, um, you're not going to see him anyway. And I don't really want to bother to make him removable, just for the sake of seeing a guy and some consoles. I've also started putting together the uh, the arms. I've not completed those yet, we'll do those in a second. Um, but basically it's sort of three components so far in. There's sort of a front section with the last cannon bowels mount. Then there's a big heat sink and then there's an armour uh, plating bracket that goes on the top, that fan shaped piece along the top. But what we'll do is we'll finish up one of these weapon arms and you can see what I'm doing here is just lightly scoring the area where I'm going to be connecting uh, certain parts to. Now some of the components I'm using JB Weld and some of them I'm using super glue depending on the component. If it needs that really super tough strong bond then the JB Weld is out. If it needs something that's not going to be load bearing then I'll use super glue. So this little piece on the left hand side is just going to drop in there um, and I am going to use super glue for that which is why I've scored the area uh, and I always use Gorilla Gel Glue for my super glue option of choice. Um, so I'm just going to run that in and that scoring allows the super glue to sort of seep into that little crack um, and score mark that you've made uh, which allows for a better bond than being on a purely flat surface. So this is a sort of a cable retainer section uh, just to add extra detail to the weapons. I'm just going to sort of press that and hold that and make sure that begins to dry in the right place. So now we have that section in, it's our case of adding these uh, half a dozen little power cables that run from that um, to the main body of the weapon. So I'm just going to drop in some super glue into each of those little holes and then we'll grab these uh, little pieces and then we'll just plop them into where they need to go. As always, always uh, um, test fit before you do any gluing. Uh, Forge World resin can warp, can be slightly off um, where it's cured in the moulds. Uh, so you just want to make sure that everything is going to fit into place correctly before you start gluing. I've obviously done that off camera um, just to save you seeing me test fit. But there you go, that's what three of them looks like. What we'll do now is just do the other three, just because it's uh, highly exciting to do so. So exactly the same process, I've given the other side about um, 20 minutes just to fully dry before I started doing these because I always find that I'm a bit of an oaf uh, and when I'm manhandling all of these uh, components that I've already just glued or whatever, uh, if I haven't let them dry then I'll end up dislodging them by accident and have to go back and, uh, and do some previous sections first and fix them up. So uh, yeah, 20 minutes later between each of these halves, you can see this one was a little bit tricky, I knew it did drop in. Um, and you do have to be careful with this kind of super glue as well. My glue does tend to dry relatively quick, so you don't have a lot of working time uh, to get the components into the right place. The next section to go on is this sort of top heatsink piece, or another piece of energy looking dispersion equipment for all these uh, super last cannons that go on the front. Again, um, just use regular super glue here uh, and test fitted before we go. Uh, that fits over those rear heatsink vents. We've also got a number of cables that are going to go on as well. So there's some cables that attach just like this underneath. Um, Forge World and Big Energy Weapons, it's all about cables. Uh, highly exciting. And again, I'm just going to use the super glue and gel once again to attach these, uh, these cables as well. Uh, and obviously I've made sure that I've scored uh, at least the main joining section of where these go. So that rear section I'm putting in now has already been scored by my scalpel blade. Um, it's pretty standard effect that I do just to make sure that the glue bonds the two components that little bit better. So you can see there that underside cable. We've also got one smaller cable that comes around the side as well. And there it is. Uh, again, um, test fit and super glue for that as well. Now these, cable, uh, these cables are quite clever because the arms are, um, are ambidextrous. You can actually build them to be two lefts, two rights, which would obviously be rubbish, but 
it's the same components pretty much used, some of which are used upside down so that you can then make sure that you've got a left and a right arm. Uh, so the cabling and everything else that I'm doing here is repeated, but you can see that little circular piece next to my right thumb. If you reverse that into the, uh, the main casing itself, uh, then it becomes the opposite sided arm. So that's all the difference between the two arm sections. Uh, and you just build everything on the other side. Uh, and that's where we get to. All we need to do now is add the Magna Last Cannons, which are these bad boys here. Uh, and then the arms will be mostly complete. Now, although I said that I anything that's not load-bearing, I don't use JB Weld on, but because these are sort of uh, a little bit front-heavy and form you know, the, mo the most obvious part of the gun, I am going to use JB Weld to attack these. It also saves me having to pin them. I've got quite a lot of faith in JB Weld uh, to mitigate against having to pin everything these days. So what I've done is mix some up in that little pot there. And uh, if you've seen my channel before, you know that I like to apply this stuff using one of these uh, Q-tips, one of these cotton earbud things. Uh, I find them really, really handy for applying this stuff without making a complete mess. If you use a little spatula or anything else, uh, it can get quite messy. And this really ensures that a lot of the surface area is smoothly covered. And what I'm going to do is apply that to the, uh, the receiving end on the weapon arm and on the two components of the last cannons themselves. With the JB Weld now applied to the ends of the weapons and into the receiver holes, all it's now do is a case of applying and pressing those components together. Give them a little wiggle, make sure that the, uh, the surface areas get covered with any sort of oozing out of that JB Weld. It's just like a thick paste, uh, but you don't want it to be too much because once it's set, it's a real pain in the ass to, uh, to remove, to be honest. So uh, we get two of those, so we're going to stick both of those in right now. Now this weapon then becomes a bit too long for any of the clamps that I've got on my desk. So uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm quite happy that they are keyed and located correctly. And then we'll leave that to set overnight in an upright position so that the gravity of the weapons just sort of keeps them in the right place. And while you've got everything mixed up you might as well make the other weapon as well. Then all we need is something suitable to hold them upright overnight to let the JB world set. and. Uh, as if by magic, they fit in a nice little mug, and here's a, a rather convenient branded mug that I can leave these things to, uh, to set overnight in. Now while the weapon arms are all beginning to dry, you can see them in the back corner of the camera, we can start taking a look at how the legs go together. So you can see we've got two foot plates and four toes on. I've already applied the toes, again using JB Weld here, because this is a key load bearing component. This is a quite a top heavy model, you really want to make sure that you know, using standard super glue it may not be enough uh, for longevity. You might end up with some broken parts. So JB Weld for the win once again. Uh, and this time I'm just trying to work out which parts are definitely fixed uh, that that are not going to move within the build of the legs. There's a lot of flexibility. You've got sort of those ball joints on the ankles, and you've got the knee joints, which have got quite a lot of movement. Then the hip joint itself. Uh, so the pose you want to kind of work on, you want to build the legs as much as they can be built where they're going to be fixed and then you can work out the uh, the individual pose of the build. So these little thigh sections here uh, are fixed for me so I can put those two together and that removes some of the variable elements when you're trying to work on a pose for your kit. Uh, similar kind of approach I'd apply to any of the Serastus or um, other Forge World Knights as well. Make sure that all the fixed components are fixed and then you can play around with the pose just means you've got less juggling to do with hands or with blue tack or anything else that you're going to use to work on the pose of the build. While those two leg sections are drying, a little bit of concurrent activity and leftover JB Weld and super glue. So I've applied the little handrails to the top um, chassis here and also the engine vents because I had a little bit of JB Weld left. And you can see there that, that is going to fit snugly over the top of there. Um, whether I attach that first before I paint it, I'm not sure. I doubt it. Um, a lot of the uh, panels do get covered up, um, but I'm a bit of a stickler for detail, so I'll actually paint him uh, and then apply the uh, the top plate. It is a bit of a, uh, a tight fit, um, but it rest assured it does drop in. There we go. It begins to drop in now. And just straighten that up, and you can see how sort of armoured and tough this guy looks compared to some of the other knights, which are a lot thinner across the top section there. And you can see it's sort of beginning to take shape. Um, there's still a head section to go underneath and the arms obviously to attach. 
but an awful lot of armor plates still to go. Um, but this uh, this weapon is now pretty dry. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to go. I've left that for a while, and just to give you guys an idea of what that's going to look like, uh, there we go. Those uh, are the weapon arms sort of just in play right there. So we can go and have a look at the legs again. I'm just going to try and work out what range of movement I've got with these. So there's four of these little piston arms that attach onto the toes and into a recess on the side of these legs. And I just want to try and work out how much movement I've actually got for the pose. Um, so you can go left and right, front and back, uh, and just want to make sure. And these are, by the way, these pistons, if you're going to do your own, are keyed slightly. So the inner one and the rear one are the same, but the front and the left are the outer plates are actually different mounted on them. They've got different uh, lugs on the front, depending on the armor plate itself. So uh, be warned when you're doing that. Uh, but you can see there how much movement is just on that front backwards and forwards. And just trying to work out how much play I've got left and right as well. Just so I can sort of have it clear in my mind uh, how much uh, movement that we've got to play around with here with the other components once they're added. Because it's all well and good having that lower leg in place thinking that's going to look cool. And then the rest of the parts don't fit. So having had a play around and knowing what the flexibility of the leg sections are, I've gone ahead and put some of them together. Now the other um, aspect you need to consider on the knee bend is that rear piston. Uh, so this one I wanted to be as bent as possible, uh, so I needed to trim the piston down and then uh, labelled me to pick the knee angle on that left one and then on the right one I wanted it to be a bit more straight legged. You couldn't really have it uh, reverse knee mounted, so I'm um, just trying to think of an animal that does that like um, a flamingo, a flamingo leg, because the pistons then wouldn't work. So, all of, so now that I've got those fixed positions on the knee bends, we can now sort of begin to work out exactly how the tilt and the legs will kind of go together and I want them to sort of bend slightly inwards towards the hips so a little bit sort of flared outwards, a little bit leaning forward uh, and then making sure that that centre plate is relatively vertical. As you can see, imagine if I had more pieces than this that were not connected together how much of a juggling act it would be to try and work out the pose. Uh, so that's why as many components I've, as I've got I've got to that stage so I can get to here and go, yep, yeah, you know what, that pose is pretty good. I know exactly now where my left leg or the right leg, it's left leg as we look at the camera, right leg of the model. I kind of now can see uh, where I want to uh, um, attach that to the foot plate. I want it at that particular angle. So a little bit of memory work here. Uh, just checking the flexibility once again, but that's kind of the position that I want it to be in. So with the position in my mind, uh, it's time to mix up a bit more of the Magic JB World. This, by the way, I am not affiliated with them. As much as I love plugging their products, I have uh, no no business connections whatsoever. I pay genuine, real money. Uh, and to be honest, thanks to my patrons, this is uh, what I spend my patron or patronage money on, is on JB, keeping my fix of JB World. So uh, just mix that up and then we can apply that to that ball joint. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll super super glue the actual uh, pistons themselves because they're not going to be load bearing. This is the uh, the key mixture really, making sure that the ball socket between the ankle and the foot plate is utterly solid. Now what I may do when I come to complete the model is actually put a a drill and a pin and come in from the bottom of the foot plate into the lower leg, so that it will go through where this joint is and then offer that extra bit of rigidity. And then the hole that you've drilled for that brass rod or whatever pin I'm going to use isn't actually visible at all because it'll be underneath the foot plate. So using the magic uh, Q-tip again, I'm just going to coat the inside of that ball joint uh, reasonably liberally, not overly, yeah, so it's going to ooze out everywhere. Uh, and then also the bottom of that ball joint as well, uh, so that I've got two, two surfaces covered with the adhesive so that when they press together they will uh, form a very good bond. They're just in the sort of the middle of there, and then we can then move on to pressing that into the right place. So now, if I remember my angles correctly, um, it's sort of coming in slightly to the towards the inside a little bit. But as this stuff takes a while to dry, we're going to need to prop it a little bit uh, so that it will dry or begin to cure in the right place. Otherwise, you can't just leave it like that. And I'm certainly not going to hold it for 24 hours because that would be crazy. So uh, just kind of looking around what can I use as a prop and then we can uh, we can move on and remove our hands and move on to something else. 
So I found a suitable pot of some uh, basing material in fact that I can use to prop open it and uh, instead of using it as a permanent prop for the next 24 hours what I'm going to do is super glue on each of these little piston rods. Now remember earlier I did say they were keyed so remember that if you're building your own. Uh, they do go in one particular order, well the, the rear and the inside one are the same, the outside one's different and the front one's different because they've all got slightly different armour plates on. So this is what I'm going to be doing is super gluing the, uh, the toe joint into that receiver that you can see there just on the demo one just using the other leg that I haven't got uh, um, JB welded at the ankle yet uh, and that because the super glue will dry pretty quick that will then hold the rest of the leg in place uh, so that the ankle JB weld will be able to dry it under its own steam at that point without me having to prop it uh, with, this, uh, with this pot of basing material. So with the pistons applied, um, that's that's reasonably solidly set now. So uh, the super glue is going to hold that um, ankle joint for me, almost like a bracing unit, and I can put that to one side and we can move on to the other leg. So as you can see, I've gone ahead and I have completed the other leg exactly the same way that I've done the uh, the left leg that you saw, well the left leg on camera, right leg of the model, uh, and you can see there with all the pistons now all uh, all sorted out. Uh, we can now put these aside, let them thoroughly dry uh, before we start playing around with anything else. But what we're looking to do is make sure that that hip section is going to be uh, nice and level. So I just want to make sure that we're all okay with that. Everything still lines up uh, and before we, because that will be the next section that we then JB weld. So just making sure that that is reasonably level. Uh, there's plenty of movement within that section, especially with this ball joint here. Just want to make sure how much flexibility I've got in there. Uh, just so that I don't really need to worry about you know checking up a hundred percent that it's perfectly flat or horizontal uh, there is a little bit of play in there so that when the torso is attached we should look good so about 36 hours later we are now magic of uh, time and video editing um, all I did was JB weld those joins to the hips and let them dry for the next 24 hours again so this is probably sort of two maybe three days worth of work now just for that drying time really but that does mean that the legs are now 100% set and we can work on some of the other sort of detailing so we've got a couple of pistons that we need to add uh, for the hip sections and then a couple of power cables as well that run from sort of the rear motor joint into the legs so I just want to make sure you know test fit in case I need to cut the piston short um, or even potentially elongate it with a bit of brass rod uh, but fortunately the way I've built the legs in this kind of striding pose, both of the uh, the pistons fit uh, exactly as they are. Uh, so super glue on for these and then we'll come back and we'll attach the uh, uh, pistons and those energy cables. So the pistons are now attached and glued and we can move on to the two sort of energy cables you can see that I'm picking up here and then attach from the rear motor joint, um, very, very similar in fact to the Questerous Knights that you get from uh, Games Workshop, so the plastic version as well. So they, they have similar kind of cables, but obviously they're plastic. These are resin. Now, again, key to test fit cables. Test uh, Cables can warp quite easily, um, but you see you may need to apply a little bit of heat uh, to get these into place. So always test fit uh, and make sure that they're going to fit. These are actually a little bit fiddly to, to get into place because of the rear, the rear leg pistons themselves. They, they, these kind of go underneath. As you can see, I'm just trying to test fit that and get that into place uh, just to make sure that the cable is of the right shape and I haven't got to bend it. Uh, there's a little bit of pressure applied here, but nothing that's going to warrant or benefit me going to get the hairdryer or uh, uh, soak it into some hot water. So that's going to fit quite nicely, so we'll go ahead and super glue those. So with those two cables applied we can now see the net effect if we just spin the model round you can see those sort of two power cables drooping down and attaching into the back of the legs with those pistons we've done earlier everything is now dry and we're good to go so just a little test yep that's gonna sit on there really <laughs> you can't really see a lot from this angle unfortunately but I just wanted to make sure that I was happy that that torso or the, yeah, the top section will fit on those legs nicely. So there we go then guys, part one of the Porphyrion. It's only going to be a couple of parts to this really. It's going to be the build uh, and then pretty much the paint job. So it's probably going to be a couple of parts to the paint uh, itself. 
So the, the, the body's built, uh, a lot of the armor panels as you saw in the video have all been left off, that is clearly deliberate um, because they are painted separately to the, uh, the skeleton works of the knight. Same way that I've done any project on knights or anything like that before where it's got big deliberate armor panels that lend themselves to be airbrushed separately and then glued on afterwards. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed the build, uh, more to come, uh, plenty more big toy action, that sounded a bit rude, uh, plenty of big uh, battle engine, big war engine stuff to, uh, to come in uh, this year. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video, if you did don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and I shall catch you guys on the next video.